Kim Book this morning. We're going to turn to page number 325. Page 325 as we all sing out on Jesus Saves. Yes, he does. Jesus Saves. Aren't you thankful for the message that Jesus saves? Amen. You know, there's a lot of stuff we hear in this day and age, a lot of messages, whether it's politics or other things, but I think the most important message you and I can proclaim is the one we just sang. Amen. Jesus saves. Regardless of political party, or regardless of preference here and there, everybody needs to hear that Jesus loved Amen. them enough to die for them and that they can have hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, Jesus saves. Get used to saying it, and I hope you take it out there as well when church is over. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll keep singing. How's that sound? Amen. Sound good? We're going to do it either way. So, Brother Mike Padgett, would you lift your voice and ask God to meet with us this morning? Amen. All right, 394 now in that blue hymn book, 394. I'm so glad that I have Christ, the solid rock that my hope is built upon. Amen. 394. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest friend, but only lean on Jesus' name. Let's take a moment and greet one another.
way back to our seats. 394, we'll sing on to that last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, for singing ushers come on up we'll receive the offering today i pray that you'll be faithful to give as the lord has blessed and i did want to make mention of this many of you know uh, miss imogene cooper was a member here for a long time she passed away she is now with jesus on uh, was that early saturday morning right miss phyllis yes. i think that's correct well anyway her funeral is tuesday at the alexander funeral home in newburgh visitation from 11 to 1 the funeral is at 1 p.m so uh, she was now how old was she was in her 90s 96 so she was ready to go and if you talk with her any length of time she told you she was ready to go and uh, and I told Miss Phyllis she, she was the type where you knew she was in the room if she was there so uh, anyway I, I appreciate uh, the Cooper family so you be praying for them and we're rejoicing in the truth of heaven amen. so amen, amen. I, I know she is she's a lot better off than she's been in a long time so we praise God for that amen. All right, let's be faithful to give as the Lord has blessed. And Brother Francis, will you ask God to bless the offering? Amen. You may be seated. Donna. I do want to acknowledge some birthdays and anniversaries. It's the first Sunday of the month, so I would like to do that. Let's see. Um, hey, Nathan, would you go get Declan, please? Yeah, his birthday's on here, and I may need you again when, I, when my eyes catch up with me. First, let's acknowledge some anniversaries, and Miss Fox, you have an anniversary on August 19th, is that correct? And how long will you and Warren have been married on August 19th? 50 years. That's what I had on here. 50 years. Can we give her a hand ahead of time? That is impressive. Praise the Lord. 50 years. That is wonderful. And uh, praise God for that. I do have a couple more on here, but I don't believe they're with us today. Is there any other anniversaries uh, in the building today? Anniversaries? Okay. Then it's you're the star of the show, Miss Fox. So let's sing Happy Anniversary to Mrs. Fox. Then ready? Happy Anniversary to you. Woo! Happy Anniversary to you. Happy Anniversary. God bless you. Happy Anniversary to you. Amen. Fifty years, Miss Fox. Has it been easy every day? No, no. <laughs> It's been difficult, but thank you for choosing to keep on going, even through the difficult. 50 years, that is awesome. That is awesome. 
All right, well, some birthdays. Let's see. Um, oh, man, Miss Selena is not up here either. I need someone to, hey, Nathan, I told you I'd need you. Will you go get Miss Selena too? Okay, go get her as well. Her birthday's then. Let's see. So let's start with um, Brother Pete. Brother Pete. Your birthday is on August 16th, right? I have on here you're going to be 118 years old. Is that correct? 118? How old are you going to be on the 16th? 79. 79 years old, Brother Pete. Thank you very much for your faithfulness. And the tomatoes. No, those are not for throwing at me. Those are for consuming. All right. So thank you, Brother Pete, for that. Miss Donna Ludwig, your birthday is the 16th, right? And I have on here 39. Is that, is that right? Okay. Making sure our records are right. I appreciate Miss Donna Ludwig very much, her faithfulness and her encouragement. And uh, Miss Ludwig, we love you. Thank you for being a part of our church. And Noah, your birthday is the 19th, right? Yep. How old are you going to be? That means there'll be three teenagers in the Leak household. Yeah, my so just just in case you had forgotten, Miss Abria, just reminding you, three teenagers. My goodness. So all that construction they're doing at their house, I think they're putting in like a wrestling ring in the basement, right? So when there's an argument, go downstairs and settle it, and they do. So Nate, uh, Noah, happy early birthday, Miss Selena. Your birthday's on the 14th, right? And uh, I appreciate everything that you do. And Miss Selena and Brother Adam have just recently started a new children's class downstairs for Junior Church. So we praise God for that. It was a need, and the Lord provided. So Miss Selena has a birthday on the 14th. And Declan, you have a birthday on the 22nd. Is that right? And how old will you be on the 22nd, bud? Nine. Nine years old. And so how old do you act? One? <laughs> he went... And his mom said, amen, amen. That's right. Well, happy early birthday, Declan. And Miss Donna Blanchard, you have a birthday. And, of course, I never forget your birthday. That's for a different reason. But That's right, that's right. We are, we are forever synced like that. Your birthday is August 27th. And I appreciate Miss Donna Blanchard, always here, faithful, playing the piano for us. You need to pray for us. She has a shoulder surgery coming up. Uh, that's for patting herself on the back all the time <laughs> after playing fire on the piano. No, I'm joking. I'm picking on her. But her birthday is the 27th, and we appreciate her very much. Matt Broman, you got a birthday, sir, on the 30th, right? And how old will you be, old man? 33. 33. 33. Matt Broman going to be 33. And we appreciate uh, the Broerman family and appreciate Matt. And uh, usually he has to wrangle in his dad. His dad's not here today, so we're, we're, I guess, thankful for that. But anyway, someone has to try to keep him down to earth, and usually it's, it's a family effort, right? But I appreciate Matt and Carly, and I think your wife's in the nursery, right? So amen. Praise the Lord for the Broermans. Miss Abby, are you upstairs? Where's Miss Abby at? There you are. Miss Abby, your birthday's the 31st. And this is hard to believe. How old are you going to be on the 31st? Well, then it's going to be a long, awkward service as we all stare at you. I have your age right here. You know that, right? I was just hoping you might provide it for us. No? Okay. I have on here 29. Is that right? No, it's not right. 26, right? 26 is what I have on here. So, Miss Abby, I mean, you could have cooperated, but now everyone's going to remember you as someone who just wouldn't cooperate. But uh, Miss Abby's birthday is the 31st. She is very faithful in our sound booth, and I'm very appreciative of her. Are there any other birthdays in, in August here that I have not mentioned? Birthday in August here. Okay. All right. Well, let's sing happy birthday to these fine folks then, shall we? Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thank you all for letting me embarrass you. I do appreciate it. Let me give you some announcements here, and then we'll sing some more songs. Uh, Tuesday, the 16th, is the primetime lunch. If you would like to attend that, please sign up on the back table. Saturday, the 20th, is men's prayer breakfast at 830. If you would like to attend, please let me know. You can check out the bulletin for all the other announcements. There's some teen things coming up. There's some junior church things coming up. So you go ahead and just check out everything in your bulletin to stay up to date, okay? 
That's all the announcements that I have. So, Brother Ryan, won't you come and let's sing a couple more songs. All right, let's all stand together one more time. Page number 429 now in the Blue Hymn Book. 429, when we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout the victory. page number 440 now a few pages over to page 140 440 and i'm so glad that when we get to heaven we may be looking for the mansions we may be looking for our loved ones but the one thing i will definitely be looking for is my savior first of all amen page 440 
God. If you would, please remain standing for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to read our scripture, and then Miss Charla is going to sing a special for us. So thank you, Miss Charla, for being willing to sing. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, please. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Now, uh, Miss Diana Fox, I did not intend to kind of use your anniversary as a story, but it fits in with what I'd like to talk about this morning. And I'd like to talk about how to keep going when you don't know how. How to keep going when you don't know how. There's a phrase we're going to look at a couple times in 2 Corinthians 4, and the phrase is, we faint not. We faint not. And so we're going to read this together, then we'll pray, and you'll be seated, and Miss Charla will sing, and then we'll jump into the message, we faint not. How to keep going when you don't know how. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Are you there? Yeah. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of uh, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise, us, uh, raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes." that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause, there it is again, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time to gather together. Lord, thank you for the blessing that is church. Thank you for these like-minded believers who have gathered together. And Lord, we all desire to hear from you this morning. We need a touch of glory. God, I pray that you'd use me as just a tool in your mighty hand. Without you, I can do nothing. But Lord, with you, we can do all things. Lord, I do pray that you'd please use Miss Charlotte. She ministers to us through song. And Lord, I pray you'd use me as I try to preach your word. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that your presence is felt by everybody. You would lead, guide, and direct as you see fit. You would get all the glory and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
singing. Guys, I'm afraid it's all downhill from here. I, I, can't, I can't top Miss Charlotte's singing, but that was, that was a blessing, wasn't it? Amen. They had just had a brief time away in Florida before the busy school year, so I'm glad you guys got to get away for a little bit. And I guess that's why Brother Brian's not in here. He's wiping his tears back there, right, because he had to leave. But 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, no one likes to be a quitter, right? No one wants to be labeled a quitter, but if we'd all be honest this morning, we would all 100% agree that some days you just kind of feel like quitting. Some days you kind of feel just like throwing in the towel. Maybe it's a ministry that you're doing in the church and you feel like you're not gaining the ground you ought to gain, so you're discouraged. You're like, nah, I'll just quit. Or maybe it's a new leaf you've turned over in your life, a, a new habit or New Year's resolution. Maybe it's a relationship that is struggling. Maybe it's a responsibility such as parenting or owning a business or being a spouse or overseeing a group of people. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a project or a hobby. Maybe it's a new diet a new health craze, whatever it is, regardless of the specifics, we have all been tempted to just quit sometimes. It's not going as fast as we think it ought to go, or all the difficulties are hard, or the the people were mean, or the circumstances, they just seem unbearable. Whatever it is, we feel like just quitting sometimes. I think that can be especially true for people in the ministry, and I'm not just talking about pastors or missionaries. I'm talking about anyone who has said, Lord Jesus, you have my life, and I'm going to serve you now. Anyone who has said, I'm going to set my life aside and I'm going to serve Christ to the best of my ability, it gets difficult to do that, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Serving Jesus, friend, it's not easy. It is blessed, but it is not easy. Difficulties arise when you want to serve a Savior whom the majority of the world doesn't know exists and some of them doesn't like Him. It is hard to say, I'm going to do that with my life. Living a life for Jesus, it is taxing. And just keeping it real, sometimes we desire to stop. Sometimes we, there's a little buzz back here, guys, that we can fix the buzz unless there's bees. Please inform me if I'm going to get assaulted by bees. But there's some buzzing on the platform. If y'all could take care of that, that'd be a blessing. But we all desire sometimes to say, you know what, maybe this would be a good spot to just kind of throw in the towel, to give it in. Maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Discouragement creeps in. Opposition rears its ugly head. And sometimes we just feel like we can't go. Now, Scripture gives us a fair warning of the difficulties that will come our way. Not might, will. How many of y'all know by now that when you try to do anything for Jesus, there's going to be difficulties that arise? Have y'all figured that out yet? I know I sure have. Now, it doesn't say what the difficulties might be, but the fact that they will be there, that is promised. Listen to some of this Scripture I wrote down. James 1-2, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. 2 Timothy 3, one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Last one, 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So it's saying when something difficult arises in your way of trying to serve Christ, don't be, whoa, where'd that come from? It's going to happen. Scripture says don't think it's strange when difficulties arise in your walk with Christ. Now in our text, Paul is being used of God to correct some of the poor behavior that the church at Corinth was demonstrating. And if you know the letters to Corinth, you know there was a lot of bad going on. And in chapters 3 through 6, he deals with ministry concerns. And in chapter 4, we see a lot of good advice dealing with the issue of continuance. Continuance. Going forward even when you don't feel like it. Now there's a lot here, but I pulled out three main points that I'd like to look at this morning in hopes to encourage you, in hopes to strengthen you, in hopes that you might decide to push forward for Christ a little longer. Are we in agreement that it's not always easy? But are we in agreement that it is always blessed? I don't believe anyone here wants to say, Pastor, I just, I want to quit. I think perhaps you might feel like quitting, but I don't believe anyone say, I'm ready to give up on Jesus. They're saying, Pastor, I just, I'm kind of at a bad spot here. I need to be provoked. I need to be encouraged. I need some help to keep going forward through the trials. I'm hoping that perhaps this morning this will encourage you. First off, you need to do. So tips for going forward and you don't know how. If you look in verse 3 through 6, there's a pattern here. Point number one is you have to stay others-minded. 
others minded. Others minded. Now, you know what the worst part about serving people is? Go ahead, say it. People. People. Y'all were thinking it, you just didn't say it. You know what it is. You know the worst part about dealing with people is the people. People have said, you know, ministry would be great if not for the people. But the issue is ministry is people. You know, there'll be people who work retail and say, oh, my job would be great if not for the people. Bank tellers, oh, I love dealing with the money. It's the people that stress me out. It doesn't matter what uh, lot in life you have. You probably are in an area where you deal with people, and it's the people who cause problems. And man, can I just say, they can be the worst sometimes. People can just, and I am people too, so I'm, I'm including myself there. We've all experienced a time at least once where you've done everything you can for someone. You've been over backwards for someone. You've tried to be a blessing. And then those, those ungrateful punks, they took everything and ran, right? You were trying to help someone who was downhearted, and, and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're mad. All of a sudden they're irritated, and they're cussing at you and yelling. You're like, well, what in the world? We've all been there. Maybe you've tried to help a child, and the child just kind of turns and runs, and it's like, do I get a thank you or something? Maybe it's been someone at the, at the store where you work, where you've helped a customer who, uh, dare I say, the Karens... We know the Karens. Uh, You've tried to help someone who's very irritated and uptight, and you think, well, maybe it'll break through a little bit. Maybe it'll be calmer. And then they don't, and they're just rude. And then they go tell the manager that you did something wrong or whatever it is. And you're like, people, man, people. After doing this over and over and over, eventually you kind of get run down. Eventually, after doing this and dealing with people over and over and over, you start to get burnt out. Well, why wouldn't you? I think of in ministry regards, Sunday school teachers and vacation Bible school workers and nursery workers, they're thankless jobs. Outside of ministry, moms and dads and employees and employers, you see, everyone eventually gets to the point where they have dealt with so much nonsense, they're done. I'm done. I can't go any further. It is not easy to be others-minded. That is why we must not give in to these feelings these emotions, these ideas, but rather continuously seek Jesus Christ every day. You say, why? Because that's why you do what you do. That's why you show up to church. That's why you invest in the lives of kids. That's why you go knocking on those doors. That's why you do what you do for Jesus. You need to keep Jesus on your mind. You have to remember why you teach that class and why you serve in that ministry and why you go out of your way to help someone else and why you show up to church and why you do all this. You see, it's not just for you. And a lot of times you admit, you know what? I'm not doing this for you either. I'm doing it for Jesus. And when Jesus is your main focus, his heart will become your heart. When Jesus is your main focus, his heart will become your heart. And that same Jesus who we're supposed to pursue, right? We're supposed to go after, pursue him, be like him. That same Jesus calls us to serve others regardless of how they may or may not treat us. I want you to go back a couple pages or maybe one page to 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. And look in verse 5. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 5, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Watch this. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, how many of y'all have heard the phrase tools of Satan? People can be tools of Satan if they're not careful. And the devil can use people who wrong us to get us wrong. Do y'all understand that statement? Satan can use people to wrong us, means irritate us, do wrong, be unkind to us. And if we're not careful, it can mess with our hearts and it can corrupt us as well. This is why we're supposed to forgive rather than cling to bitterness. 
Listen to what it says in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us in certain words to give to those who try to take from us. Now that goes against human philosophy, doesn't it? And to go the second mile for those who need us to. And to lend to those who need. And to love those who don't love us. And to do good to those who hate us. And to pray for those who use and abuse us. Now, you don't do these things because you just love the people. Right? Well, I just love people. We'll be around them long enough and you won't love them that much longer. You don't do these things because you necessarily love the people. You do these things because you love Jesus and he commands us to be others minded. Say, well, I don't like them. That wasn't the topic of conversation. That wasn't the question. Jesus didn't say, well, make sure you like them before you serve them. Make sure you like them before you pray for them. That's not what he said. He calls us to be others minded even when it's inconvenient. Oh, but Lord, they're so mean. Oh, but Lord, they're so vile. Oh, but Lord, they're, they're not Christians. Oh, but Lord, they whatever. Was that part of the equation? Or did he tell you to love them? You don't do these things because you love those people. You do these things because you love Jesus. And he commands this of us. To do something as amazing as serving people and helping people, even when you feel like, well, they're not worth it. Well, they don't deserve it. It's something not of this world. When you're able to somehow weed through the nonsense and be there to help someone, even when it seems like they don't want to be helped, say, well, they're, they're rude and unkind, and they do this, and they, and they blaspheme, and they talk like this, and they do that. But to be able to push through that and still serve them and love them, that is something on a heaven level. Now look in our text in verse 14. It says this in verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. How many of y'all need grace for living day to day, huh? Verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish... Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That means your temporary, we'll call it nonsense, you have to deal with. If you handle it the right way, you will receive some type of reward that, what does the Bible say? Exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Can I tell you guys that the nonsense you have to deal with, it's temporal, it won't last long. And Jesus sees it, and we do it unto him in the first place. It says in verse 18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So guys, you have to stay on target when dealing with people. Because people are people, and people always gonna people. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus the whole time time. You need to keep your heart on glory the whole time. Keep your mind parked in heaven and eternal reward the whole time. Never get over what Jesus did for you on the cross all those years ago. So then when you're looking face to face to someone who's treating you unkind or being rough with you or being very uh, uh, unservable, right? Making life difficult. You can say, you know what? I can tolerate this a little longer because of what Jesus tolerated for me. You have to keep your mind on Jesus and you have to understand that the heartbeat of Jesus is people and people getting saved. And if you want to be used to see other people saved, you can't be rude to them. You have to push through that, bite your tongue, tie your lips shut, do all kinds of stuff to her, even if all you can do is go, "Uh uh-huh. How many of y'all been there when talking with people before? Just, "Uh uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you have to because Jesus is worth it. And can I tell you, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. One of his biggest commands and points of emphasis was being others-minded. Listen to this text, Philippians 2, verse 6 through 8. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, 
and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Can you just ponder how much nonsense Jesus put up with there in his last days on earth? The mock trial. He saw right through that. He knew Judas would betray him. Some of the Pharisees and the haters he was always dealing with, they were always there all the time. And yet he served these people. He loved these people. It blows my mind. He is a savior worth serving, is he not? Don't give up on serving others. Don't give up on people. Say, why? Well, has Jesus given up on you yet? I think we ought to continue for him because he's worth it. When you're feeling like, nah, I got to quit, I got to stop, you got to remember, keep your eyes on the prize. Stay others minded. Park your mind on Jesus. You spend enough time with Christ, eventually, I promise, your heart will start to open for other people and you will be able to help others. Number two. Pastor, I want to keep going, but don't know how. What do I do? Number two, this is important. It's in verse 7. Stay plugged in with God. Stay plugged in with God. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What that means is when we're trying to do something supernatural like this, guys, if you're running on your own battery, it's going to die pretty quick. But thankfully, we have a power source that never goes out, right? Now, I think we all struggle with attempting to kind of play lone wolf once in a while, where we think we can do it on our se- all by ourselves, we think we can handle it, no problem. Whether it is our marriage, our children, our health, our ministry, our job, our finances, you name it. God has made it obvious that he not only desires to help us, but that he also has everything we need to do it the way we're supposed to do it. So not only does he want to help us with our endeavor, but he also has everything we need to do it. Any tool you might need, he's got it. And yet we make so little of this thing called prayer. You know, I don't care how awesome of a vehicle you drive. If it's out of gas, it's just an oversized paperweight. I don't care how impressive your KitchenAid mixer is. If you don't plug it up, it ain't mixing nothing. I think of lawnmowers and vacuum cleaners and different appliances. What these things have in common is that they run on a source, whether it be fuel or electricity, something like that. If you need them to do what they're supposed to do, you've got to make sure they're connected to the power source or at least filled up with that source of power. They have to have the power or they're not going to do anything. Christian, your power source is the Lord. And yet you and I try to operate this life, which is hard in its own self, right? It's hard by itself. But then trying to do it in a Christ-like manner, that's even harder. And yet we're trying to do this thing without spending time in prayer, without being fed by the word of God. We're trying to lone wolf it and God's like, what are you doing? Why do you feel like you can navigate this maze without me, especially when I'm right here free of charge? (laughs) God wants to help us and yet so many times we're like, I can handle this, I can handle this. Friend, you're, you're running on E. Your battery is low. Your power source is the Lord, and by the way, it's been that way since you got saved. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Titus chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. In Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just a handful. There's all kinds of scripture that tells you your salvation is of Jesus, but also your new life ought to be through Jesus as well. There's a lot of Christians that get saved and they say, thanks a lot, and they go about their merry way and they're done with Bible, done with prayer, done with church, done with obedience, done with all that stuff. They have their newfound life, that's great, and now they're gone. 
And then they wonder why they're getting discouraged out in the world. Why they feel empty. Why they feel incomplete. Friend, it's because you're not living in Jesus as you ought to be. There's saving grace, yes, but there's also living grace and we're empty. And we wonder why we feel so discombobulated. That's the word of the day. Why do we feel so off? I think the grace has run out. Not your saving grace, your living grace. Most of us here know that we cannot save ourselves. We've sinned. The penalty for sin is hell. We could not deliver ourselves out of that, so we needed a Savior. God sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, and all who believe on Him can, that can, be, can be saved out of their sin and can have eternity in heaven with God. But understand that that was nothing we did, and it was nothing we do that saved us or keeps us saved. It was all what Jesus did for us. And this is the same pattern that ought to be in place for our very lives. Because Jesus quickened us from death to life. And he desires, as it talks about in John 10, to give us an abundant life. And yet so many Christians let their joy, their love, their power, and their zeal fizzle out after they've been saved a while. It's like they've like, meh, yeah, it's okay, we're good, I'm done. They don't lose their salvation but they lose the joy of it. They lose the zeal of it. All of a sudden, the hunger for God's Word is not there, and the hunger for church is not there, and the hunger for prayer is gone, and they don't know why, and the reason is because we're starving ourselves spiritually. We're trying to go out into this world living for Christ by ourselves when Jesus says, I can help you. I can strengthen you. You're meant to do it in my might anyway. Only Jesus can save you and only Jesus can get you th some of these, these down and dark times you face on earth. We feel like, well, I can handle it. But you don't have to. And some of the things you flat can't. I used to make a statement just like a lot of people. say, well, God won't give you anything you can't handle. I, I renounce that. There's a lot of stuff he's given me that I can't handle. And it has forced me to fall on Jesus and say, Lord, I can do nothing. And then guess what happens? It somehow works itself out. Guys, why are we trying to do things ourselves? It's just stressing us out, making us anxious and crazy. When God's right there and he desires to help. If Jesus is good enough to save us, then surely he's good enough to sustain us. Why in the world are we trying to do it without him? Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You see that? I talk about that. That's one of my soapboxes. I didn't bring it with me, but I can use the pulpit, I guess. A lot of athletes will claim this verse. I can do all things, but they leave out the most important part. There are well-known athletes who, who have that verse tattooed on their arm or on their shirt or on their sneaker. I can do all things. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ. We cannot forget the most important ingredient to that verse, that formula. It's Jesus. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty seven. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, all the verses that I just read to you, those were written to Christians. As in these were the folks who were already saved, already knew the Lord. The writer is just telling them, God is using the writer to tell them, you can win this battle through Jesus. You can't just give up on Christ. I've been saved, that's great, I'm going to go home. No, friend, you still got a battle to fight. I don't have a battle. We just established we all get to a point you feel like quitting. If that's not a battle, I don't know what is. You ain't going to finish your course by yourself. You need Jesus and you need his sustaining grace to help you through it. I believe everyone here would say, I want to continue forward for Jesus. But I would ask you to evaluate when's the last time you walked with him. And I mean really walked with him. I mean took a walk in a park somewhere or just walked around the house or walked around your neighborhood and just talked with the Lord. Not with headphones and not with a device in your hand. Just walk with Jesus for a little while. What used to be a sweet hour of prayer 
That's just a quick empty prayer over food sometimes. When's the last time you got super excited to open up God's word in the morning? Before anything else. I'm so excited to get up and just open up my Bible and get inside it. Or when's the last time we attempted to, as we talked about in Sunday school, sow the seed of the scriptures in hopes that others might be saved, share the gospel with someone, lead a soul to Jesus? When's the last time you got emotionally overwhelmed at God's goodness for you in spite of you? When's the last time you looked at the mirror and you said, you know what, God's been good to this old sinner. I I am nothing special and I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a wretch, but Jesus loved me enough to save me and walks with me and blesses me far beyond what I deserve. When's the last time you got excited at that truth? If it's been a while, I encourage you to do that today. Look yourself in the mirror and say, I don't deserve anything that I got. But boy, God's been good. I want you to be real with God and yourself this morning and ponder these times. You know, I'll suggest maybe you don't need a new Bible. Maybe you don't need a new church. Maybe you don't need a new routine. Maybe you don't need a new diet. Maybe you don't need a new anything really. Maybe you just need a new fire. A new excitement for what Jesus did in your heart when you got saved and is still constructing as we go. Salvation is instant, but sanctification is a lifelong process. When's the last time we got excited about God is growing us? Oh, I had a victory over this battle the other day. Oh, I saw a truth in Scripture I've never seen before. And we got excited that there's a fire burning in us that Jesus put there. And I'm excited for the things of God. And I'm excited for my Bible. And I'm excited for prayer. And I'm excited to, to share these things. And I'm excited for what God's doing. Perhaps you just need to reignite that fire. A new look at the old book. We need to move aside this old dusty furniture of our heart. Find out where that outlet has come unplugged and blow on it a few times. Wipe away those cobwebs and plug in that puppy back to its power source. Maybe you just need a small revival in your heart. And guess what? God can do that too. Psalm 85, 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. In Psalm 138, verse 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. I, I, I got on a hobby horse in Sunday school. I started yelling. Brother Ryan was like, Man, you were preaching in Sunday school. It comes out once in a while. <laughs> But I started thinking, you know, a lot of times we blame our lack of walk with God on everybody else. Hey, I don't affect your walk with God at home. It's the television we're watching. It's the stuff we're letting in one ear and hoping no one notices. And it affects the way we uh, read the scripture and it affects our desire to do things. It's the things we're letting affect us out there. Well, that preacher, I don't have a revival in my heart because that preacher, because that church, because that family, because that president, because this politics, because this nation, because my favorite fast food place closed. We have all kinds of excuses on why I can't be revived, but the scripture I just read says, Will thou not revive us again? It's a heart thing, church. And perhaps you feel like fainting because we haven't cleaned out our heart in a while. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. That shows me it's not a everyone else thing. It's a me thing. Be real with God and yourself this morning and ponder the last time you got so excited you just couldn't handle it. I think some of y'all would be fun to watch so excited you couldn't handle it. Some of the things you might do or things you might say. If it's been too long since you were really excited about what God had for you at church, if it's been too long since you got really excited about the truth you're about to dig out of God's word, if, you, if it's been too long since you got excited about sharing Jesus with someone else, friend, you might just need to reignite that fire in your heart. I am not picking on you because you feel like quitting. Every single one of us have been there, and I'd be willing to bet at least half of you are there right now. feel like giving in, whether it's church or something else. I, just, I feel like giving in. We can do this, but we can do this through Christ. You need to get plugged back in with God. You need to reignite that fire. 
reignite that desire for Jesus in your life. It might amaze you what an on-fire walk with Jesus could cure in your life if you were on fire. I don't mean just casually moved. Church was such a blessing. I'm talking about I'm fired up. I'm excited. My scripture reading on this dreary, rainy Tuesday morning, I got in my Bible. God spoke to me. I just had a shout and fit. When's the last time that happened? Where there was genuine excitement and amazement at how good God is to us. Tips to keep going. First, we need to stay others-minded. Second, we need to stay close to God. Get plugged back in. And last one, number three, we need to stay thankful. We need to stay thankful. Look in verse 15. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the what? What? Thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Church, I think one reason we, we t- were tempted with quitting so much is we lost the praise. We lost the gratitude. We have forgotten how good God's been to us. And I believe when we lose the gratitude and thanksgiving from our minds, then discontentment steps in. And rather than being thankful for our lives, we start to question, well, how come it ain't like that? How come I don't have that? How come they get it and I don't? Or vice versa, how come this happened to me and not to them? And all of a sudden, the entitlement mentality sneaks in. And it breeds a heart of bitterness and anger. And it leads us to want to quit on God and quit on whatever it is we're tempted with quitting on. I deserve better than this. Things ought not be that way. And rather than praising and thanking God, now we're making excuses. If you're tempted to quit anything this morning, I want you to honestly consider the last time you stopped and praised God for everything you had in your life. When's the last time you just praised God? You woke up and you looked around and you realized, man, God's been good. Paul knew the importance of being content and grateful for what was given him. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You see, Paul wasn't spending too much time on looking at what he didn't have. He was too busy thanking God for what he did have. Because whatever God gave to him was an undeserved blessing. Psalm fifty fourteen. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Paul said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 8, that if he had food and clothes, that was enough to be content. And I'd say to you, church, that if you have a meal to go home to today, whether it's a restaurant or home or you got to suffer at Jalisco's or whatever it is, if you got food to go to after this, you're very, very blessed. And if you have clothes on your back and you even have another change of clothes at home, you got it pretty good. It might amaze you, church, to take a missions trip to some of these places that have no clothes. I'm not talking about they don't have clothes they like. I'm talking about they have no clothes. They're wearing a grocery bag. Or how about have no food? Could you imagine leaving here and like, I don't have any food. I don't have any money for food. I don't know how we're going to eat. That's how a lot of people today in 2022 are living. Some in the United States. <laughs> Paul was ahead of his time when he said, you got clothes? Yeah. You got food? Yeah. You got everything you need to be content. God's been very good to us. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So if nothing else, church, you have Jesus who likes to hang around you. We got a lot to be thankful for. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. How about just the ability to pray? You ever been awake in the middle of the night and no one else is awake and you need someone to talk to? How about that? How about the fact that God lends his listening ear and will listen to you? The fact that we can pray. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. 
Psalm 26, 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. So how about not just the ability to pray, but how about the ability to praise God? That in itself is worth the praise. Lord, thank you that I can thank you. <laughs> thank you that I can praise you. You are worthy of it. When you're trying to help somebody, when you're trying to serve others, it's easy to start to feel taken advantage of, isn't it? It's easy to start feeling overworked and underappreciated. And it's in times like these that, yes, you can be tempted to feel like quitting. But church, if you can remind yourself once in a while to stop and thank God for what he's done for, with, for you, with you, how he saved your soul, how he loves you in spite of you, how he blesses you continually when you and I know you don't deserve it. You say, how do you know? Because I know that I don't deserve it. Think of the many things he's gifted you with and how he's helped you through your troubles, how he's always been there, even through the deepest of heartaches and trials, how he has shown you grace, how he has shown you unmerited favor, how he's never forsaken you and never given up on you and only loves you and helps you. It makes it a little easier to go one more day when you're thankful. Are you thankful for the life that you have? You should. Now listen, you and I can always pick and choose the negatives, right? Well, but I have this going on, and well, this is bad, and I wish this was better. You and I can pick and choose that all day long. But when you stop and you realize, understanding my life is not perfect, and not everything goes my way, yes, I have frustrations, yes, I have battles, I promise you, church, that with all that, there is someone right now who would love to have your life. Whether it's in the, someone you know, whether it's just someone in our country, whether it's someone around the world, there is someone who would listen to you complain and they would think you're bragging. You would, you would vent all your frustrations and they would think, you have got an incredible life. Whether you know it or not, you have a lot to be thankful for. Every day you ought to be grateful for the life God's given you. Let me close with this. Twice in our text, Paul said, we faint not. As in, we don't quit. That's not in our vocabulary. We don't quit. We don't give in. There's only one other phrase that I have found that he uses it, and it's in Galatians 6, 9, and I'll read it to you. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Turns out there's a reward coming our way for those who just plug on through. To those who just say, you know what, Jesus is worth it. Let's see what kind of craziness we can get involved with today. Let's just keep going forward. I believe with every fiber of my being that if we can just hang in there and keep going forward for Jesus and keep taking steps of growth and keep making Jesus look good to this wild world we're living in, it will be worth it all. And I believe Jesus has the ability to reward and bless us beyond our imaginations. But that verse there in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We talked about Miss Imogene Cooper being with the Savior she loves. One of these days that will be you. One of these days you will take your last breath on this earth and you'll wake up and you'll be looking at Jesus Christ himself in the eyes. Would you like to be able to say, I didn't quit? Lord, I, I didn't do a lot right. I made some bad decisions, made some mistakes. I didn't have a lot of talent, not a lot of resources, but Lord, I was faithful. I was faithful. I don't think there's anyone going to be in heaven when they got to heaven, saw Jesus and said, man, I wish I'd have quit. I wish I hadn't have given so much to that church. I wish I hadn't invested so much in my class. I wish I'd have just kind of, you know, phased out a little bit and just took the last 20 years off and just kind of cruised, you know. I, looking at Jesus, looking at heaven, looking at the beauty that awaited me. Yeah, I wish I'd have quit. I think there's going to be people wipe tears and say, I wish I'd have done more. It's like life was a vapor. And all of a sudden I woke up in heaven and I'm like, there was so much more to do. The least we can do is just continue. Continue. 
we faint not. Choose to faint not. Choose to endure. Choose to continue for Christ because he is worth it. Lord, we need your strength. We certainly cannot continue in our own might and our own strength. We lack in that area. God, would you please reignite that fire that was in our hearts? Lord, perhaps it just went out for some of us. Lord, perhaps there's still a flame. Lord, regardless, wherever we're at in these areas, Lord, would you please help us? Would you reignite this fire in our hearts, and would you please push us forward for you? God, I don't believe there's anyone in this building who would say, I want to quit. I think there are people who would say, I feel like quitting. I think there are people who would say, I feel like there's no other choice but to quit. But God, I believe in my heart that everyone here in their heart of hearts desire to continue for thee. We desire to push through the nonsense for you. We desire to serve you. Lord, we desire to finish our course with joy. We desire to have crowns to lay at your feet. Lord, we desire to serve you until we bump into you. But Lord, we can't do it without you. Would you please strengthen God, would you please give grace? Would you please deal with our hearts in the areas that you would have us dealt with? We'll praise you for how you handle us today. We are yours and we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand with me if you're able to? Stand with me, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. And Miss Donna will play a verse of invitation. The altar's open if you'd like to come forward and pray. Perhaps you got someone on your heart. Maybe you know of someone who has quit and, and you're trying to pray him back in. Maybe you're like, honestly, pastor, I kind of feel like throwing in the towel sometimes. Sure, we all do. Would you pray for strength? Because I'm telling you, as much as I love you, as much as I want to encourage you, you can't do it by yourself. Many have tried and many have failed. But with Jesus, the Bible tells us we can do all things with Jesus. Not apart from him. Not with a little dose. With him. Through Christ, we can do these things. If you desire to finish your course with joy, to hang in the fight, would you please make that known to the Lord today? If you're here and you don't know for sure heaven is your home, and you'd like to know how you can be saved, don't leave here till you talk to me. If you wanted to come up, I could show, have someone take the Bible and show you how you can know. What a great day it would be to leave here knowing for sure heaven is your home. Whatever your need, whatever your concern, let's do business with the Lord. I'm done talking. If you'll look up here, I do appreciate you being here. I know a lot of folks are traveling, so keep them in your prayers, but I hope you'll be back tonight at 6 p.m. I do have a brief order of business. Miss uh, Carissa Ledbetter and her two boys, Carter and Raylan, right? They have been visiting with our church for a couple months now, and uh, she would like to unite with us in membership. And as we were talking about what a blessing that is, the timing, because Miss Donna is about to have shoulder surgery, Miss Carissa has the talent of piano playing. And, uh, and knows music and things. So what a blessing that is. So uh, all in favor of uh, the Ledbetter family joining our fellowship, say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? I did not think so. Miss Carissa, could you go to the back door and people are going to want to come by and shake your hand and welcome you into the family. So 
Miss Carissa, welcome home. Tell your boys I said the same thing, welcome home. And you guys on your way out, get by, shake your hand, and welcome, them, welcome her into the fold, all right? So as for the rest of y'all, let's close in prayer, and then we'll be back tonight at 6 p.m., all right? And uh, Brother George Brenneman, I appreciate the Brenneman family very much. Uh, yeah, you're included in that. Brother Brenneman, would you please lift your voice, close us in prayer, and when Brother Brenneman is done praying, we are dismissed. Thank y'all for coming.